All right. Joseph Prince says, as the Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthian believers who had failed that there was still a temple of the Holy Spirit, John reminds us of who we are in Christ. Let me just fix that. This is not to encourage us to sin, but to encourage us to look to our Lord Jesus, to see our sins punished at the cross, and live victoriously and gloriously for him. That is what true repentance is all about. Turning to the cross and returning to his grace. When you fail today, know that you can talk to God honestly about your failing, but do it with the revelation of the cross of our Lord Jesus. See your sins punished in his body and receive afresh his forgiveness and unmerited favor to reign over your sins. He's, the problem with this is, John is editorializing what the Bible says. We're not looking at everlasting life. We're looking at a daily walk with the Lord. And when you confess what you're doing wrong, just like your human father, you can't disassociate yourself with not being your father's son anymore. He's got, you've got his DNA. But when you don't behave right, then becomes the situation of being disciplined. But we don't lose our salvation. We don't have to worry about we're going to hell just because we made some mistakes or sins, even as bad as they are. So I said to him, don't you get it? In the context of committing sinful acts in the temporal Christian life, to return to the grace of God for a believer is to return to God's fellowship when we sin in the temporal life. We don't return to our salvation. We already have that forever. This is what Paul is talking about here. Paul is not talking about returning to the grace of God relative to salvation unto eternal life. That was already and forever established at the point of faith alone in Christ alone when they, we, became believers. When Paul writes of the shortcomings of the Corinthian believers, the implication is that they acknowledge their sins, in other words, confess them to restore their fellowship with God, not restore their salvation. Just because you do wrong doesn't mean you get uh, disowned by your father, your human parents, in the same way. And just because you make some mistakes in the Christian life doesn't mean God says, okay, you're no longer my son. You get born again. You can't get born again and unborn again and born again and unborn again. That's nonsense. And that restoration is solely by the grace of God. That's the context, isn't it? The same as in 1 John chapter 1. The word fellowship appears and not salvation. To do it with the revelation of the cross of our Lord Jesus is precisely what John is writing about in 1 John 1, 7. We quote, If we believers walk in the light, of the righteousness of God, implying, acknowledging, when you as a believer fall short of the light, the righteousness of God, the blood of Jesus purifies us of all unrighteousness unto fellowship, not eternal life. So stop editorializing. You have eternal life once and forever, all by the grace of God. The believer, whether sinning or not sinning, his eternal life is eternally secure. Go to my website, look up the uh, index, and you'll see passages on eternal security over and over and over again. Once you believe, you become a child of God. You can't get unchilded any more than you can get unchilded from your parents. So, Joseph Prince goes on to say, Do we confess our sins under grace? And I say, the question, do we confess our sins under grace, is nonsensical not in the Bible and should be ignored. You can't make up phrases. Do we confess our sins under grace? It is not clear what this question is intended to mean. If it does not appear in Scripture, then it should not be addressed as if it were. But he's doing that and he's making up his own meaning. This, there is no passage that explains the answer to this foolish question. If we think about confessing, Confession, confessing is for the believer. 
and we confess them, then God's grace forgives them and purifies you from all unrighteousness. If that's what he means, he shouldn't make up his own phrase. Just quote the Bible. 1 John 1 9, just quote it. Okay. Joseph Prince goes on under this paragraph heading, Once when I was preaching in Italy, a prominent psychiatrist to whom I had been in, introduced shared with me something heartbreaking. He told me that he was counseled many, he has counseled many sincere Christians who are living defeated lives, some even in mental asylums. Wow. Because they believe that being right with God hangs on their ability to confess every sin. Total misreading of this passage. I can't, and nobody else can be responsible if you decide to misread a passage in the Bible. It's pretty clear, and if you don't understand and you're having a heartbreaking uh, situation, ask somebody you trust that knows how to read or is not willing to manipulate the Bible to your own ends. Here's my answer. By now, you must understand that God is not asking the believer to confess every sin in order to be right with God for eternal life. You confess the same thing that he, God, brings to mind, which is evidently not every sin, and he forgives those sins and purifies the believer from all unrighteousness unto temporal fellowship and blessings in this life, eternal life having been secured forever at the point of faith alone in Christ alone. I brought this out to a friend of mine. I said, if you're a baby Christian, you just became a Christian, God isn't going to remind you of every little single little thing you do. You don't even know enough. He's just going to remind you of a few simple elementary things and ask you to admit you did wrong and then redirect your life in the proper direction. And he purifies you from everything. You're still in his good graces. That's the way you do it. You don't hang uh, your hat on something a kindergartner in elementary school didn't get right because he didn't know the proper uh, uh, tense in a Greek ver in, a, in an English ver uh, verb in, in, in the book that he's reading. Just correct him in a way that he would understand, in a simple way, not overwhelm him with everything he has to confess. So uh, this psychiatrist and you, Joseph Prince, are way off base. Nobody's asking you to confess every little thing you do every day. God's going to correct you in accordance with your spiritual maturity, and then he purifies you from all unrighteousness, and you're just as good, ready to go on to the next step. That's how you should be trained in any endeavor. Don't overwhelm somebody with all the mistakes he's done on the first day at the work, at the job. Joseph Prince says, My friend, can you see how dangerous this teaching is? Yes, it's dangerous, and you're wrong. Without the assurance of complete forgiveness, but you have it, at the moment you got saved. These believers are sin conscious, burdened with guilt and shame, because you did that. The, the passage doesn't do that. Condemned by the enemy, joyless and totally insecure about their salvation. You caused that, Joseph Prince. The Bible didn't. Bible study manuals. Learn to read fellowship is the issue, not assurance of eternal life. If you've done something wrong, just like a human father, Maybe you cross the street where you shouldn't have. He'll gently remind you of that. And not every little thing. You have a scratch on your bike and you stepped on this and that. You overwhelm the poor kid. He'll never come out of his room. Assurance of eternal life is clearly explained throughout God's word based on a moment of faith alone in Christ alone no matter what. And that's it. You're assured you're a child of God forever. And it does not involve being sin conscious, burdened with guilt and shame, condemned by the enemy, joyless and totally insecure. Joseph Prince goes on to say, Yet the truth is that every believer has total forgiveness in Christ, whose eternal blood keeps on cleansing them from all sin. Actually, that's wrong. It doesn't keep on cleansing you from all sin. The sin's already cleansed before you even commit it. It's done at the cross, and that's the end of it. Stop being, putting a guilt trip on everybody. The moment they know this truth, heaven comes into their souls as, as it did for Francis Havergal, a famous 19th century hymn writer, and the effect this produces in their lives is not a desire to go out and sin, but a desire to live a life that glorifies their Savior. Actually, that's not correct. Not every Christian does that. And so don't put a guilt trip on that, too. Just because you're Christian doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. He who knows that he is forgiven much, forgiven of all, actually will love much. Not always true. 
Wrong again, I say. There are no guarantees that a believer will have a desire to live a life that glorifies their Savior. That's a work in progress. That's why we have the epistles, their instructions. If you do it right, we get blessings. If you do it wrong, here's the way to go. It's, we need to correct it. Or that he who knows that he is forgiven will love much. Well, the problem with that is I know I'm forgiven, but I'm flawed. I don't necessarily love God because sometimes there's stuff that I'm fearful about, even at these many years, and I have to make that correction. Nowhere in Scripture is this guaranteed that we're going to glorify our Savior all the time. So don't put that guilt trip on. I've not met a Christian in my whole life that glorifies God all the time. We have, we're always a work in progress. When we get to the next life, we'll get a perfect body, and all this sin will be behind us. But that's God's doing, not ours. The epistles indicate that believers must study to show themselves approved. Amen. Following the leading of the Holy Spirit. And depending upon their response, they will be provided with rewards and or discipline depending upon their faithfulness. Like a human parent does or supposed to do. Joseph Prince. We confess our sins knowing we are already forgiven, not to be forgiven. I don't know where you got that. So is Joseph Prince against a Christian fellowshipping and confessing his sins? Let me say this clearly. I do believe in the confession of sins, and I do confess my sins still. But why, if you already know you're forgiven? But there's a big difference now. I confess my sins knowing that all my sins are already forgiven. Well, then why do it? Why conf I don't confess my sins to be forgiven. That's what the word verse says. Because I have a close relationship with my Heavenly Father, I can be honest with Him when I've done wrong. Then confess it. I can talk to Him about it, receive His grace for my weakness, and move forward knowing full and well that He has already forgiven me through His Son's sacrifice. And I no longer worry about the fact that I can't possibly confess every sin, because I know it's not my confessions that save me, but the blood of Jesus. Let me answer that. 1 John 1 9 does not stipulate that one's sins are already forgiven, even before one confesses them. So don't add that. It's a nice idea, but don't add that. God's got his point. Don't He doesn't need help. The question arises then, why confess them at all if they are already forgiven? And, and suppose the believer stubbornly refuses to admit the wrongdoing. Will they still be forgiven? No. If a child refuses to correct his behavior, he gets punished. He doesn't get unchilded, but the punishment will meet the offense. What Scripture says must not be tampered with. Your statement about 1 John 1 9 is nonsensical. God is not a nonsensical God. He doesn't need correction. Let me write that in there. And he does not need you to correct him. 1 John 1 9 says what it says, and it is not to be tampered with regardless of how close a relationship you think you have with the Father. If you think you have a close relationship, I don't think it is close when you're correcting him. Instead of obeying what 1 John 1 9 says, you don't have the latitude to change what God has provided for you to do to receive forgiveness and purification of all unrighteousness. You also imply that you have to confess every sin. Yet you stipulate that you cannot confess every sin. Therefore, it seems you don't confess like you think the verse is saying. Actually, when you read the verse, it says, what God brings to your mind, it may be one thing. And just admit, yep, I did wrong. And then he forgives that one thing you confessed and then purifies you from everything else that you didn't even know, perhaps. And, and get, you get a little pat on the back, keep on moving. That's not honest, by the way. It's deceptive. You can't confess every sin. Neither can I. So don't. You're not asked to. Actually, the verse does not stipulate that you have to confess every sin. Only those sins that God brings to your mind, maybe only one, and he will forgive those sins and purify you from all unrighteousness. Finally, you still don't get the fact that 1 John 1, 1 through 10, is all about restoring fellowship with God, not about, not about keeping your eternal life intact. Let me correct that. Not about. Not about keeping 